we're going to continue our verse-by-verse study in 2 Samuel 14. And the title of tonight's message is How to Navigate the Path to Reconciliation. And while you're turning there, I'll go ahead and tell a story. Um, Last year, I had the opportunity to go to Kansas and do some work. Uh, And I did like any responsible guy would do when he goes someplace. He checks and sees what the good fishing and hunting things are while he's there, right? (laughs) So I text my buddy, and he's like, yeah, there's tomorrow's the last day of turkey season. So if you want, we can go out. I got a couple tags left to field. I I said, absolutely. So I show up at his place uh, way before dawn, jump in his truck, and it's already got everything loaded in the back. We drive off, go through down some trails through the woods across a couple fields and uh, down through some more fields across another and through some gates and end up getting out he's like we got to walk the rest of the way because we don't want him to hear us so we jump out of the truck he grabs the bag full of all the the decoys and I grab the bag for the blind for us to sit in and we start walking and end up going across this field and go through some more trees through another gate and through another field and some still not up yet and you know you can still see the moon up there and all the flyer, fireflies dancing across the field and all the cobwebs on the grass and the dew just starting to settle on them. Really awesome. If you're hunters, you know what I'm talking about. It's a different feeling. <laughs> so end up going across through one more gate and we end up coming into another field and he's like, okay, this is where we got to set up. This is the place we got to be. I'll go ahead and set the decoys up here. You set the blind up over there. We'll be good. I was like, okay, sounds good. I go over there, start setting up the blind. He's doing the decoys. We go and we sit down inside the blind. As soon as we sit down, hear this big voice from up above us. That's not a good place to hunt. I'm like, what? I'm thinking somebody's above us. I'm like, did you hear that? And uh, he's like, oh yeah, well that's God. You know, and he's right. It's not a good place to hunt. We need to move back by the tree line. About, so we end up packing up the blind, going back another 30 yards, and set up the blind again, and we sit there. And as soon as we sit down, hear another booming voice from above. It says, you can't hunt there. <laughs> Seriously? God's helping me out hunting, you know? <laughs> you hear that voice? He's like, yeah, that's God. And he's right. You know, we got to be on, around down further to the tree line, get out of the way of the wind so the turkeys won't smell us. So I was like, okay, so we packed up the blind again. We go on over there and set it up. We go to sit down. Another third time, we hear that big, booming voice coming down again. I can still see you. You still can't hunt there. This is a zoo. (laughs) So that is a really easy way to get yourself banished from a zoo. (laughs) I'll tell you what, (laughs) and a few other places. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be covering a story about how David deals with the banishment of Absalom. Uh, Remember some of the backstory. Uh, There was Amnon, which was David's oldest son. Uh, He ended up uh, raping his half-sister, Tamar. And then the other half-brother, Absalom, ends up killing Amnon because of it. And And this whole time, all David did was weep. He felt sorry for it, right? He didn't really intercede or do anything about it. So Absalom was banished. He left the city of Jerusalem. And that's where we pick up tonight's message in 2 Samuel 14, verse 1. It says, So Joab, the son of Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was concerned about Absalom. Uh, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for giving us a tonight and being able to come together and get into your word. Uh, We thank you for those of our church that are out on a mission trip tonight. Pray that you keep them safe, bless them, bless their travels, uh, bless their hearts, allow them to be able to minister your word and do your will where they're at. And pray that you open our hearts and open our minds tonight as we get into the word and your message. Pray that you speak through me to be able to deliver your word of truth, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 1, it says, so Joab. Who is Joab? Uh, Remember, Joab, he's showed up a few times already. Uh, He is King David's nephew. So Joab's mother is David's sister. And he's also the general of King David's army. So he's really high up there, and he's also a relative. Uh, If we remember a little bit further back, uh, his brother, Asahel, 
was killed by Abner, uh, a gen or, who was a general of another army. They fled. They lost. Ab or, Asahel was really fast. He was swift. He took off running after him, and he caught up with him. And then Abner ended up hitting him in the, in the stomach with the butt of his spear. He didn't hit him with the pointy end. He didn't mean to kill him, but he did kill him. So uh, Joab, he ended up wanting to take revenge on Abner, even though it was an accident, he, he ended up going behind David's back and set up this whole ploy, and he ended up killing Abner. And this was after Abner and David were coming back together to try and reconcile differences uh, and unite the kingdom of Israel. And then because of this, David actually cursed Joab in 2 Samuel 3, 28, 29, says, afterward, when David heard of it, he said, my kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner and the son of Ner. Let it rest on his head, on the head of Joab and all of his father's house. Let there never fail to be in the, in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper, who leans on the staff or falls by the sword, or who lacks bread. That's a pretty rough curse to be on your family and be on your head for being part of your family. So that's one of Joab's interests is by getting involved in this and by, by trying to reunite David and Absalom is maybe to get this curse removed from his family so that way they won't have all these things here. Um, another thing is to, for him to find favor with David because, you know, David is king and that can also encourage that too. Another thing would be for him to find favor with Absalom because Absalom would be the next person in line for king, right? Amnon's no longer around. And the second son, uh, Chiliab, uh, he was mentioned once, but there's no other mention in the Bible, so we have to assume that he probably passed away. So the next one in line would be Absalom. So if Joab would make friends with Absalom, he could, you know, still keep his position in there. He's really loyal to Israel, too. And the, the last thing would probably be to protect David from Absalom, because Absalom's off in this far city, and he can try and start up a rebellion and come back against David because he would say you have a claim to the throne for being an heir. So all these are different interests that Joab would have to uh, encourage him to be involved in this. And we see further in first one, it says, uh, Joab perceived. And how do we know he perceived? We can go back just a couple verses uh, in chapter 13, verse 37. It says, but Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Jeshur, and David mourned for his son every every day. So this, this first morn right here is David mourning for his first son. And then Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there for three years. So for this full period of three years, David's still in mourning. And King David longed to go to Absalom for he had been comforted concerning Abnon because he was dead. So during this three years, uh, Joab's his general he knows where, you know, David is, like, in his life, and he can see the changes. He can see the mourning in him. Uh, he can see that longing to go back to Absalom. So he's like, hey, this is my opportunity to step in and reconcile them back together. And this is where we find out that Joab has a plan that he's hatching to make all this happen. And we see that plan in verse 2. And Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, please pretend to be a mourner. And put on mourning apparel. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but act like a woman who has been in mourning for a long time for the dead. Go to the king and speak with him in this manner. So Joab put the words in her mouth. And Joab, you know, he knew he couldn't do the same thing as Nathan just did just a little bit ago. You know, give him the story and say, point his finger and say, hey, you're that guy, you know. <laughs> um, so he had to be a little bit more resourceful and come up with a different plan. So he plans to go to uh, this city called uh, Tekoa, which is 12 miles south of Jerusalem, where they were at, and it's six miles south of Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is actually in the middle of Jerusalem and Tekoa. So it's the equivalent of, say, somebody from Tampa, which is a really big city, and they go over and they pass over Sarasota, which is a big city, and they come all the way down here to little old Punta Gorda to find a person to do their thing for them. So it was close enough where it would be able to believe what it was, but it was still further enough away where it would be hard to investigate the story that he puts in her mouth. So he feeds her a story, 
uh, to play in the, as a role in the front of King David. Uh, he, he tells her, you know, to dress like she's a mourning person, you know, and someone who's sorrowful, uh, to look that way, uh, you know, n- don't smell all pretty enough. You know, you've been mourning for a long period of time, and this is how you're coming to, to King David. He gives her the words, the mournful words to, to speak to her. So he gives her all of this, um, but it's, it's almost perceiving like he's hiring an actress. You know, he gives her the dress. He gives her the look. He gives her the words. All she has to do is go here and act out this scene. And that's what Joab's giving her to do. But uh, King David also has a role in this all too. You know, he's the king of this big city in Jerusalem. Uh, part of uh, his role as king in Jerusalem was to be the head of, say, the Supreme Court, our equivalent of the Supreme Court. Each city had their own little uh, judge area where people could take their, their, their cases to court and see, uh, get the resolution within these small cities. But the main city, the king's city, Jerusalem, where King David sit, is like the high court. And that was part of King David's role. He's the only judge on top of this high court in all of Israel. And that's how Joab planned to bring this story, is to give her a story to come and plead her case in front of this high supreme court. And that's where you find what her story is in verse 7. When the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. When the king said to her, What troubles you? She answered, Indeed, I am a widow. My husband is dead. Now your maidservant had two sons, and two fought with each other in the field, and there was no one to part them. But one struck the other and killed him. And the whole family has risen up against your maidservant, and they said, Deliver him who struck his brother. That way we may execute him for the life of his brother whom he killed, and we will destroy the heir also. So they would extinguish my ember that is left, and leave behind, leave my husband, neither name nor remnant on earth. And this is the story that she pleads to King David. Uh, essentially, she had a husband. Husband passed away. So now all she has is the two sons that she had with the husband. This is all that would remain of their family line are these two sons. But these two sons, they were out in the field, and they were arguing. One struck the other, and the one passed away. Um, a lot of the details of this are kind of in the gray area of where the law was. You know, if it's something was really specific, she could have got a judgment at a lower court. But she comes to the Supreme Court because some of the, their laws in these times are gray and they can be uh, perceived differently. Uh, take, for instance, there was no one in the field to break them up. Okay, so if there's no one in the field, that means that there were no witnesses, Right. We have some of the same laws in our society today. If there's witnesses, that makes the case that much stronger. But if there's no witnesses, it makes it a hot, lot harder to argue your point in front of the judge. So there's no one there to break them up. There's no witnesses. Um, it said that they were struck. It didn't say with what. The Jewish law had laws pertaining to if someone was struck with a rock or, say, a spear or, or sword as opposed to by accident. It didn't say exactly how it was struck. So this falls back in that gray area and is supporting the fact that she could bring this case to him. And there was no, also no reason as if there was, if it was intentional or not, or like he premeditated it all. Um, whichever way it did happen, the fact was that she was left with only one son and the rest of the family wanted vengeance for that one son's death. So they wanted to kill the only son that she had left. And with her not having any sons, we know that can greatly reduce her chances for having any grandchildren, right? <laughs> so um, I don't know if you all ever talk to any grandmas at all, but uh, if you can't, you talk to my mom in the back. She talks about her all the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, something like that can make it uh, a lot more appealing to be able to, and, and emotional to be able to bring that case in front of somebody. And that whole mournful and family strife type of scenario that she's bringing in front of David, he can relate to on a personal level because he's been mourning for the past three years, right? And he's also been having a lot of inner uh, family strife, you know, brother, sister, brother, and all these conflicts within the family. So the story is still close enough to David where he can relate to it on a personal level, but it's still a little bit far enough away where he wouldn't raise suspicion 
as to know that that you know, finger might be pointing his way. So her story was strong. It was, it was uh, vaguely specific, and we can see how David responds in verse 8. Then the king said to the woman, go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. So right off the bat, David, you know, like any true politician in a political form, you know, defers decision. You know, he says, oh, well, not right now. Now's not right the time to, to do it. Um, it could be that, you know, maybe after a period of time, he would hope, like, this case may go away. Or after... Um, a, a period of time, it may give them more time to investigate the case because, you know, they, they do live far away. Uh, but in verse 9, she presses them a little bit further, says, And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, O Lord, my lord, O king, let the iniquity be on me on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. So she presses them a little bit further, and, the, and uh, he says in verse 10, Whoever says anything to you, bring him to me, and he shall not touch you any more. So next, he uh, de defers uh, a little bit of the judgment. So he's, he says, if anybody has a problem, you know, I'm not going to make a decision, but if anybody has a problem, tell them to come talk to me, you know, and we'll straighten this out later. He could have done that for a couple of reasons too. One, that, you know, nobody wants to come and argue a case in front of the king. You know, who's going to do that for a little petty family matter? <laughs> you know, he's got a lot bigger things to do about, so they don't want to step in there or else... If someone does happen to chance, come and talk to the king for that reason. You know, it may give him an opportunity to find out more information about the case. So David's really smart about how he's responding to these events with her. Uh, verse 11, she still continues to push the matter a little bit more. She says, please let the king remember the Lord your God and not to permit the avenger of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. Uh, the avenger of blood here is almost like uh, an appointed executioner. In their times, there was a person who was uh, nominated by the rest of the family to carry out judgment on guilty people. And they could go into cities and pretty much co commit that, you know, their whole death sentence uh, completely legal. And she's still making one last plea. Don't give them an opportunity to kill my only last son. And he continues and says, as the Lord lives... Not one hair of your son shall fall on the ground. And lastly, David decides his judgment right here. Uh, you know, he pardons the son and forces reconciliation between the family. So David delays, David defers, and David decides. And this is for my Baptist friends here tonight that likes repetition. <laughs> um. This is the decision that she was essentially looking for, right? You know, she wanted that pardon. Or so that's what she wanted him to think, right? We can see more about how she starts to project this story onto David in verse 12. Therefore, the woman said, Please let your maidservant speak another word to my lord, the king. And he said, Say on. He probably said that a little bit sternly too. It's like, okay, I just gave you what you want. What more do you want? <laughs> so the woman said, why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks of things as one who is guilty, and that the king does not bring his banished one home again. For we will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up. Yet does not, your, does not take away life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. Now, therefore, I come to speak of this thing to my lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid. And your maidservant said, I will now speak to the king. I may be that the king will perform the request of the maidservant. For the king will hear and deliver his maidservant from the hand of the man who would destroy me, my son, together from his, the inheritance of God. Your maidservant said, the word of my lord, the king, will now be com comforting. For as the angel of, the lord, of God, so is my lord, the king, in discerning good from evil. May the lord your God be with you. So this is where she ends up pulling that Nathan. You know, she points the finger at him and saying, oh, you know, this is you. This story that I had is you. She says, this is you and the relationship that you had with your son Absalom. And she's referring to the water spilt on the ground here. Uh, it's, and referring to once that water is on the ground, 
uh, you can't put it back in the cup. Uh, you ever spilt water or anything on the ground before? I've got a little girl. She spills stuff on the ground all the time. You can't pick it up quite the same. You know, you can try and use a rag or a mop or something, put it back in the cup. It's not the same thing. And that's what she's referring to here is that once that opportunity has expired, once that person has passed away, you don't have that opportunity again to reconcile your differences. And that's what she's saying also that, you know, the Lord God provides opportunity for uh, reconciliation and make those opportunities happen. And she says, this is that opportunity. This is that time, you know, make reconciliation with your son. She's pleading with him. But then she also makes a mercy plea at the same time, you know, because she knows she came to David, this high court, and she pretty much lied. She perjured herself. You know, this isn't a real story. You know, you can get in a lot of trouble. She could be executed. She knows this. So she's praying for mercy at the same time, saying, be mercy for, merciful with my king. I did this for your good. I did it for your good. It wasn't any ill intent of mine. It was for you, I, you know, I, and that's what she was trying to explain to him, hoping that he would be merciful and understanding. But then this is where we see David's wisdom come out, because we know David's very wise. Verse 18 says, Then the king answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide from me anything that I ask you. And the woman said, Please let my lord the king speak. And the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? <laughs> Kind of just like that, right? <laughs> and the woman answered and said, As you live, my lord king, no one can turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has spoken. For your servant Joab commanded me and put all of these words in my mouth of your maidservant to bring account the change of affairs your servant Joab has done this thing. But my lord is wise according to the wisdom of the angel of God to know everything that is in the earth. So David's no fool, right? Right off the bat, he goes straight to Joab. She know, he knows that she can't be alone in this big theatrical event that she just put on. He knows that Joab has different interests in there. You know, he, he's been uh, looking for ways to get back in with the family, uh, get in right with David, get in right with Israel. And plus, you know, he's the only guy standing in the back of the room giving high fives to everybody. He's like, I win, I win, I win. <laughs> so this is part of David's wisdom, but now we have an applied wisdom. How is David going to apply this to his actual decision with what he's going to do with Absalom? Verse 21, and the king said to Joab, all right, I have granted this thing. Go therefore bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed him and thanked the king and said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord, O king, and that the king has fulfilled the request of a servant. So Joab arose and went to Jeshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but did not see the king's face. So David sent Joab to go get Absalom. This is kind of what Joab wanted, right? This reconciliation, bringing them back together. Um, on one hand, it could appease Joab by his, some of his concerns, thinking that Absalom might be starting a rebellion off in a far city. And it could also be that first step leading to reconciliation between King David and his son Absalom. But keep in mind that this wasn't a full forgiveness either, right? He brought him back to Jerusalem, but he said, you know, he can't see my face. I don't want to see him. You know, we're not going to meet up at all. So it's only a partial way there. He's kind of still leaving that door open, hoping that maybe the Absalom would, would maybe make, make him another, another move. But this whole time, we're only hearing one side of the story, right? Where has Absalom been during all this? We can find that in verse 25. Now in all of Israel... There was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, at the end of every year he cut it because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, his hair weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels, according to the king's standard. To Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. Sounds a little familiar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. And Absalom dwelt 
two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. Now, that took a really quick turn, didn't it? <laughs> it almost reminds me of some of the judge uh, shows you see on TV. You know, one person argues a case, and you start to get a grasp of what's going on, and next thing you're, you know, the other person talks, and you're way off in another direction. Like, am I still watching the same show? We're talking about, you know, resolution between David and Absalom and judgment going through. Next thing we're talking about is Absalom's long hair and his beautiful, you know, grooming habits. <laughs> so it really went off into left field really quick there. Um, but just a note, you know, Bible is really weird sometimes. Uh, 200 shekels is estimated at five and a half pounds of hair in one year. That's a lot of hair. Um, I don't know why this is in the Bible. Um, you know, it, it could be that sometimes, you know, vain people are a little bit more self-absorbed with themselves instead of others. Um, not saying that if you're, you know, a godly person that you can't be good looking either, you know. <laughs> uh, my wife is one. I married one. So. Um, but it also says that Absalom had three sons and a daughter named Tamar. Um, part of this uh, naming his daughter Tamar, you know, out, went out of his way to say in the Bible that that's what he named his daughter, almost stands in place as justification for what Absalom did. Saying, you know, the whole reason all this happened is because of Tamar. So it's his justification for his sins. And also by naming his daughter Tamar, maybe he gives her another opportunity, you know, to live outside of what happened to his sister. Even though it's not his sister Tamar, it's his daughter Tamar. Um, but time-wise, there was two years in Jerusalem, three years in exile, another two years that he took planning the, the assassination of his brother. So it's seven years in total since this incident happened, but it's five years since he's seen his dad. That's a long time without seeing his dad. And during this whole time of five years, his, his sense of justification and the amount of time coming together made his biz bitterness towards his father grow even more. He was, you know, he was stewing in the pot. Even though he, he was there in Jerusalem, he still couldn't see him. And we can see uh, coming up next where, you know, how his bitterness actually explodes and comes out. Verse 29 says, therefore, Absalom sent for Joab and sent him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again a second time, he would not come. So he said to his servants, see Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there? Go and set it on fire. And as Absalom's servant set the field on fire. And Joab arose and came, home, came to Absalom's house and said to him, why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, look, I sent you saying, come here, so that I may send you away to the king and say, why have I come from Jeshur? I would be better off for me to still be there. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face. But if there is iniquity in me, let him execute me. So Absalom sent a message to Joab twice. Right? And the next obvious step would be to set his field on fire, right? <laughs> it really escalated quickly. No, he, he sent two letters in the mail, USPS, and Joab never got them. And he completely skips over the other steps of going over himself, ringing the doorbell, knocking on his door, sending him a text or an email, Facebook friends requesting to see maybe if he's over in Cocoa Beach surfing or something like that. And he goes straight to burning down his pantry. It must have worked, though, because Job finally got the message and, you know, he came over to talk. Uh, but I don't know if, you know, Joab's the, the general of David's army. I don't know if a general coming over in the middle of the night because I set his field on fire coming to talk is such a good thing. I was a Marine. I know how salty some of those guys can be. Uh, and if it wasn't uh, David's son, it probably would have ended up entirely different, you know, if it wasn't the king's son. And I wonder if Joab put as much effort into Absalom as he did David, 
how much different this might have turned out also. Because remember Joab, you know, he made the whole unification, then he left them there, the same way that David did. But we see how out of his mind Absalom actually is. Between his whole justification with Tamar, setting the field on fire, and then also what he says in verse 32. He says, but if there's any iniquity in me, let him execute me. This reinforces two things. One, that he thinks that he's completely justified in what he did, everything. You know, murdering his brother is completely justified. Uh, setting, you know, Joab's field on fire is completely justified. And the second thing that it, it verifies is that he's completely walking outside of the will of God. Verse 33 says, So Joab went to the king and told him. When he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And then the king kissed Absalom. Nonetheless, we see that in spite of all these things, that Absalom still gained an audience with David. And David forgave him. But there was nothing offered on Absalom's side there was no justice, there was no repentance, and there was no resolution. And we'll see in these next upcoming chapters how much worse things will become for Absalom, how worse they'll become for David, and then also the nation of Israel. Now, I know we're already to the end of our text and we haven't had any points tonight, right? <laughs> I hope I'm doing this right. <laughs> But in the true spirit of judicial reconciliation, I wanted to wait until the end to do all of our deliberations and applications. After all, how fair would it be for a judge to make his judgment on a trial at the beginning or the middle of the trial, right? How fair would it be if you'd go by a boat and put it in the water and only to find out later there was no motor in the boat? How fair would it be if you would come to church on a Thursday night at 5.30 and eat the meal in the back, come in for church only to find out later that it wasn't gluten-free. <laughs> but first, we need to find out what reconciliation is. Uh, my business mind says that it's making financial accounts consistent with each other, balancing both sides of the books so that way they'd come into harmonization with each other. Everything squares and evens out. It doesn't mean that you have a zero account on it, or that you're in the black or the red, it's just making sure all your books are even. The definition of it says, it's a restoration of friendly relation. It's bringing together different parties back into a relationship that they formerly had. I'm going to use your notes here, Chris, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Reconciliation is like taking a piece of paper, ripping it in different places, so you have two parties. Something happened between them. They broke apart. Reconciliation is bringing those two pieces back together so that way they're as close as possible to what they originally were. In our earthly encounters, that's not always possible. You know, all these little rough edges don't always line up, but we try our best. But with two parties, there's two different roles within reconciliation. Our first role on the path to reconciliation is forgiveness. One party forgives the wrongdoing of a second party. This was King David's role in the story we just covered tonight and his forgiveness of Absalom. But what's the application to us? Should we strive to for forgiveness? I would say yes. Matthew 18, 21 through 35, Jesus gives the parable of the unforgiving servant, right? There was a servant. He had a big debt to his master. And the master ended up re forgiving that giant debt that he had. Uh, and then afterwards, that servant ended up going back to where he was at and looked up another servant who owed him a small little debt. And he demanded that small little debt from him. And when that other servant failed to provide that debt, he put him in jail for something really small, minuscule, compared to what he just had. That, that news made it back to the master. The master ended up saying, 
why'd you do this? You're a wicked servant. You know, I just forgave you this big thing. And you're fighting over something small and little and petty. So he took that servant, took back his debt, and threw him in jail. And this was a parable that Jesus used to apply to us. He says, same way that I have forgiven you of your sins, which is very big, you should forgive others of all these small little things. But how does it apply here a little bit more? You know, nobody else, uh, Absalom never came back to David for anything else, but was David right in trying to go first? Should we try and forgive other people first before they come back for us and you know, say I'm sorry or whatever it was? Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Neither side of that coin points any, to anything that someone else would do, right? It's all towards your actions. Whether you for forgive or whether you don't forgive, it's all upon you on your actions, not anyone else's. And you're going to be held accountable to be God to God for your own actions, not someone else's. The second rule on the path to reconciliation is repentance. The definition of repentance is from the word metanoio, which means to change one's mind, feel sorry, or self reproach for. It's to be one way and change direction and be another way and be completely different but for the better. In this story, it should have been applied to Absalom, right? But we didn't read anything about Absalom changing his mind or feeling sorry or, or going one way to another. He didn't show any repentance to David or even to God for that fact for what he's done. But sometimes terminology can confuse people. It can be applied a little bit right here. Um, say you're in a small group of people and your phone rings and you take a phone call say, excuse me, i got to take this call, right? Uh, that word excuse means to justify an offense. It was wrong. You knew it was wrong. But you want to excuse the offended offense or defend to a fault. Instead, the word pardon is an action of being forgiven for an offense. It's a wrong but you want to show mercy and forgive of that, forgiveness of that wrong. So next time you answer your phone in church, you could say, pardon me, instead of, excuse me. <laughs> Absalom, however, he was all about excuses, right? He says, oh, well, I did this because of my sister Tamar. Excuse. I did this because you wouldn't let me see my father. Excuse, right? I did all this because I had long flowing locks of hair, right? No. <laughs> but still, you know, he had no, no, he was all excuse. Uh, true repentance is a pardon for knowing you were wrong and asking for mercy and forgiveness. This is the kind of p repentance that we should seek with other people. And it's also the same kind of repentance that we should seek with God. So, now that we have full sides of the story, we have one big question to ask. Was this good advice for David that came from Joab and the old woman from Tekoa? On a personal level, from one person to another person, from David to Absalom, I would say yes. The damage was done, the trust was broken, and the relationship would probably never be the same again but any restoration is better than none. Even if it's not as strong as before, it's more glorif glorifying to God to have two parties that are ha partly reconciled than two parties that hate each other. How about on a familial level? Was this good advice for David? You know, he was the father of Absalom. Is this good advice for him and his, and his son? I'd say probably, maybe. Uh, reconciliation is good, but honestly, their relationship needed a lot more attention long before this incident happened, right? On one hand, Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, 
Do not provoke, provoke your children to wrath. You think banishment and exile for five years would be considered provoking? Maybe a little bit. But Proverbs 22.6 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Maybe Absalom's life needed a little bit more training up as a child, and he wouldn't have departed so far from where he is now that we see him, right? Maybe this is a little bit of David's sin coming back, like how Nathan revealed to him, right? But how about a professional level? Was this good advice for David on a professional level? Probably not. I don't think so. David, he was king of Israel. And David, as king, he has an obligation for justice. And that's our third point, is justice. It's that payment for wrongdoing. We say justice is served when a thief is shot while he's stealing, right? We say justice is served when a murderer is sentenced to death penalty. Or maybe justice is served when a bomb maker accidentally dies from his own explosion. Was there any justice on behalf of Absalom in this message? Was there any price that he paid, any penalty? No. This was all an emotional response and decision, even on David's end. In the end, Absalom still killed his brother, and he never paid any price for doing so. When there is a lack of justice, it can lead to a misunderstanding of sin and consequences of sin. We see that a lot in today's society, right? Uh, say, the first time someone takes a drug, uh, they're probably not going to overdose. Ver- first time a gambler places a bet, you know, he's probably not going to lose his house. The first time someone decides to cheat on their spouse, they're probably not going to get caught. The first time someone drinks alcohol, they're probably not going to experience that organ failure. Many times we sin and we don't associate immediate consequences, but that's only because uh, the fact that God delays consequences of sin. It's his mercy. And it gives us one more opportunity to come into a right relationship with him. We do that by repenting of our sins, putting our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, and he promises to forgive us of our sins. Do you know that God is the only one that can properly dispense justice the way that David tried to do here? There was a sin and and reconciliation, but there was no penalty for that sin from Absalom. Uh, Jesus Christ can dispense justice this way because he already repaid the penalty for that sin. That, That sin has already been paid for. And that was on the cross. And one day, God's going to reconcile all things unto him on earth and in heavens. And justice will be paid by his blood on the cross. That's Colossians 1.20. And it's up to you whether or not you repent and give your life to Christ and let him pay the penalty for your sin. Or you end up taking that consequence on yourself. And you don't want that, my friend. So our summary, three different things that you'll find on the path to reconciliation is forgiveness, repentance, and justice. Uh, Let's go ahead and close in prayer.